Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Soraya Wintersmith, reporter for GBH News. Thank you for joining us for the 12th edition of our monthly Beyond the Page book club. Tonight, I'm excited to join Sadiqa Johnson, author of this month's selection, Yellow Wife. A few things before we dive in with this fabulous writer. Shout out to Trident Booksellers and Cafe, who partnered with Beyond the Page Book Club on this event. Trident is open for curbside pickup and limited capacity in-store browsing. Visit them in-store from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., seven days a week, or on their website 24-7. Next, I want to run through how we do discussion here at Beyond the Page. You all in the audience won't see yourself on video, and you won't be able to speak during the author interview, but we do want your input. You can ask questions by opening the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and typing in your question, and you can start doing that right now if you like. Also, if you see a question that you want to hear the answer to, you can vote for it by clicking the thumbs up. That will vault the question up to the top of the list and give me a cue about working it in. Zoom has also recently rolled out an automated captioning feature, and we're excited to offer this now so that everyone can enjoy our events. To turn on the closed captioning feature, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Two transcription display options will pop up. We recommend that you select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript and a sidebar window opens up where you can see what each speaker is saying. Please bear in mind that closed captioning might be slightly delayed. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Sadiqa Johnson. Sadiqa Johnson is a Philadelphia native who currently resides in Richmond, Virginia with her husband and their three children. She began her career as a public relations manager for famed authors such as J.K. Rowling, B.B. Moore Campbell, Amy Tan, and Bishop T.D. Jakes. Her writing career took off with her first novel, Love in a Carry-On Bag, winning multiple awards, such as the 2013 Phyllis Wheatley Award for Best Fiction, the OOSA Book Award, and USA Best Book Award for African American Fiction. She currently serves as a Kim Belio Fellow. She's a proud member of the Tall Poppy Writers, as well as a professor of fiction writing to the MFA program at Drexel University. She's also a former board member of the James River Writers there in Richmond. Welcome, Sadiqa. Oh, hello. So good to be here. Thank you. Golly, you make me sound so good. <laughs> well, you're super <laughs> accomplished, and we all know you are a fabulous writer. Will you please start us off with an excerpt from your novel? I would be happy to. So if anyone in the audience has a copy of Yellow Wife and you want to follow along, I'm just going to start from page one. Chapter One, The Bell Plantation. Mama believed that the full moon was the most fertile night of the month and that everything she touched held God's power. Each full moon, she dragged me out in the middle of the night with her to hunt for roots, plants, seedlings, and rare blossoms to use for healing. I did not understand why God's power could not be found during daylight hours. And as I trudged behind her, the March cold overwhelmed me. Even my thick wool shawl was no match against the country freeze. Fear of the woods made my feet clumsy and I tripped over fallen sticks, scratched my shins on the spiky brush and bumped my head on low hanging branches. Mama, on the other hand, moved with skill and confidence, like the earth parted a path and presented the way for her. Even in the dark, she knew where to stop for herbs and how to avoid the dangerous ones. We had only a small lantern to guide us, and when I asked how she knew where things grew, she responded, my gut be my lot. We slipped through the thicket, past the drafty cabins where the field hands slept on pallets stuffed with hay and husk. I heard dry coughs and a low whine from a hungry baby. Farther down toward the James River, we traveled through the clearing where we met on Sundays for church. Then over the hill, along the side of the cemetery, peppered with sticks to honor our dead. As we traveled deeper into the woods of the plantation, the thick forest blocked the light of the moon. I could hear the growls and grunts of unseen animals and 
fretted over running into hungry raccoons or red foxes or stepping on a poisonous snake. I tried to clear the worry from my mind as the land flattened out, but then something pricked my ankle. Before I could call out, Mama stopped suddenly and reached for my hand. This here is a black walnut tree. Grow deep in the woods, so you gotta know where to look. Cure for most everything. Ever unsure, come seek this tree. Mama handed me the lantern, then pulled a blade from her satchel and severed a piece of bark. She brought it to her nose, then ran her tongue along the inside of it. Pus stains anything it touch. After we make a tea for Rachel, rest we use to dye those sheets for the nursery. Just hoping we ain't too late to save that girl. Mama reached into a bag and pulled out a red ribbon. Gone in market, so it'd be easy to find when you come without me. I reached up and tied the ribbon on a skinny twig, knowing I had no intention of roaming these woods without my mama. And so begins our journey. <laughs> Uh, one more thing before we get started, a reminder to everyone that we will be discussing the end of this novel during this event, as well as other potential spoilers. But Sadiqa and I will do our best to warn you all in these moments. Uh, so Sadiqa, let's jump right in. Who is the Yellow Wife? Well, the Yellow Wife is actually inspired by the true story of Mary Lumpkin. I discovered her story while walking the Richmond Slave Trail in 2016. And the Richmond Slave Trail is about two, two and a half miles along the James River. And there's 17 different markers along the river that talk about the, the, the migration of the enslaved people into Richmond. Richmond being number two in the slave trade industry behind New Orleans. So there was a ton of history. And as we read the different markers, we came upon the marker of the Lumpkins Jail. And it was said between 1844 and 1865, over 200,000 enslaved people passed through this particular slave pen. It was a punishing center and a, a place where families were separated. And it was owned by a man named Robert Lumpkin who was known as the devil, he was known as the bully trader, and this particular jail was called the Devil's Half Acre. And what drew me in was the fact that the marker said that Robert Lumpkin was married to a black woman and her name was Mary Lumpkin. And my first thought was, what was life like for her? You know, was it a marriage of survival? Was it a marriage of sacrifice? Did she love him? What type of relationship did they have? And then it said that they had five children together. And while he was so mean, Robert Lumpkin, and so vindictive to the people, you know, the enslaved people, they said he treated her with compassion and he treated his family with compassion and dare I say love. And that was really the beginning of me feeling like I needed to know a little bit more about her and about these children. So I started digging. This is perfect, this is perfect. Tell us about your process. Like where did the digging start? And did you look to any like writers for inspiration? Well, at first I didn't feel like I had the skill set to write historical fiction. My first three novels were contemporary fiction. And so I just felt that this was beyond me, but it was almost like a calling. Um, I remember the day and we, we were standing, um, you know, at the end of the Richmond Slave Trail, there is the African burial ground. and this is where the enslaved people were buried and there was no ceremony. So they literally just waited for the bodies to pile up. They shoved them in the ground. And so that space in Richmond has been preserved. And as we walked the, as we walked the grounds, I could feel this energy. It was like the ancestors were waiting for us. And I thought, I thought you know, maybe the ancestors are waiting for me. I felt charged to tell this story. Mm. So I started digging. I went to uh, different plantations in the Richmond area in Charles City, which is where the story begins. And I walked the land. I, I needed to smell it, feel it, taste it, touch it so that I can connect with this story. I spent a lot of time in the Library of Virginia, which was wonderful. The librarians were great at finding articles that talked about the Lumpkin Shale in this period in history. 
Um, and then I also read books written by enslaved people. Slave narratives really informed my writing because it, you know, a textbook, there's a bit of a film between the writer and the actual event that happens in history. But when I read books written by enslaved people, it was like I was up close and personal with their story, with their journey. And that was the way I wanted to tell Yellow White. Mm. I think it's amazing that you're saying you felt like it was beyond you. I'm so glad you took on the challenge. Was it easier or harder once you got into it? I imagine once you have a framework, like you have a lot of space to play. You know, once I said yes to it, which took me a while, <laughs> but <laughs> because I was afraid, you know, and I had done all this research and I could see the story starting to frame, but I didn't think I had the skill set. So I had a friend who came over and she was asking me what I was working on next. And I'm telling her about this story. And she says, and I said, you know, but I'm so, I'm so afraid. And she says, the thing that scares you most is the thing you're supposed to be doing next. And it was like, that just cracked the window for me just a little bit. And so I jumped in and, you know, I started with the idea of Mary Lumpkin. I knew very little about her. Women like her, unfortunately, have been blotted from our history. And so, you know, when I was researching her, I may find like two sentences in one book. I may find a paragraph in another book. And so, you know, the thing I knew was that she came to the jail as a child and, and, and that was kind of her beginning. But I knew in order to create a story that was fluid, I needed to start her on a plantation and have her move to the jail. I also came across uh, Anthony Burns, who was the inspiration for Essex Henry's character. And when I came across him, it said that he was an enslaved man in Virginia, who was born in Virginia and he escaped to Massachusetts. And very much the way I describe Essex coming back from Massachusetts and coming to the Lumpkins jail, that was his real story. And in his real story, it said that Mary Lumpkin took pity on him and gave him a, a hymnal from church. And when I read that in the textbook, I thought, oh, that's a beautiful brew for a love story. So I said, I'm gonna take him, put him on the plantation. I'm gonna create this love story, separate them and then bring them back together. So I just started to get all these different pieces. When I start a novel, I always feel like I have all of these beautiful Christmas ornaments, but I don't have the tree. And so these were my Christmas ornaments. And then as I got into the story, I had to figure out what my tree looked like to hang the, hang the ornaments on. We got questions coming in already. Um, when you dream up a character, or in this case, you have the framework, do you immediately think about qualities that you wanna give the person? Some of that, you know, I start with a, a bio for my main character. So I wrote out a bio for Phoebe. I wrote out a bio for, for Essex. But what happens is, is once I get into the story, so that's just kind of a framework for me. Once I get into the story, the characters start to tell me what they want to do. You know, <laughs> they start to move in a way that I have to follow them or I'm not going to get the, the juice of the story. Mm -hmm. So I, I do have an idea, but I also have to, see myself as the conduit that the story is trying to flow through me and, and follow the directions of the characters. I'm going to go to our Q&A and this one is very popular. It says, since it was illegal for a white to marry a black, how did the population handle a slaver cohabitating with a black woman and treating her as his wife? I think that we see in the book, uh, the jailer, as Phoebe refers to him, um, is dealing with his own kind of not second class citizen status, but he's ostracized because as we find out, it's considered pretty dirty, right? Yes, and that's exactly it. Um, so for the men like like Ruben LaPierre and my story, um, they were seen as the pariahs of society. So no, no self-respecting well-off white man would marry his daughter to a man like the jailer um, or any of his friends. And so the way I detail the scene where the jailers and their wives come to the dinner party to celebrate Hester's birthday, 
was, was a figment of my imagination, but it was also in my research, what I saw to be very popular was that these men, because they couldn't get a quality white wife would then choose mulatto women to have their children and to have their family with them. And so they actually um, did not get married in Virginia, according to my research. They went out of the state because marriage was illegal at that time for blacks and whites, they couldn't marry. If you saw the movie Loving, you know that it took a, a quite a long time for Virginia to say okay to that. Um, but they actually, I believe may have gone up to Massachusetts and got married after he uh, freed Mary Lumpkin in real life, after he freed her, uh, they went and got married legally. And he left his property and his fortune to her in his will. And when I read a portion of his will, he said, I leave my real estate, and I'm paraphrasing, but my real estate and my fortune to my yellow wife. And he was referring to Mary Lumpkin because she was mulatto. And then he said, I leave you know, my horse and my carriage to my black concubine. And in my story, that would have been sissy. And so that was the way he separated his, his property. And that's where I got the title for the book, The Yellow Wife. Tell me about deciding to explore the tenderness between the two of them. Because when we hear about him, I know when I was walking around Virginia, like devil's half acre, all you hear about is how terrible this man was. And yet in your story, we see a loving connection almost. How did you decide to write that? Yeah, I have to say he was the most difficult character to write because he was a man of two faces. And so he was the devil on one side. And then he was this man who was tender and caring towards Phoebe and their children. And it was a line that I had to constantly sort of toe as I was writing the story because it was, I, I thought, I felt that it was necessary to see both sides of him in order to make the story three dimensional. Um, but it was, it was difficult because, you know, he was very unliked, <laughs> you know, even, even for me as, as I was writing the story, but then I had to kind of shift and, and show you the other side of him as well. Mm -hmm. And I think even in just listening to the way that you Read this next question from um, our member says that you wrote this novel in a voice that's so real and so raw. Um, you've already told us a little bit about your research. I'm wondering about your process. Where do you go to convey like the depth of emotion, both the tenderness and the sadness, like the pain that we see in the story? I was a theater major in college um, and yeah, so that helps an awful lot. So for me, it's all one thing, right? So I'm, I become the characters, I'm sharing their emotions. I feel it the way they feel it. You know, I've been known to cry when my characters are crying because I'm so caught up in their world. So that really is what it is for me. If I don't feel it, then it's not going to come up well mm -hmm. on the page. I have to give my whole self over to the to the characters, to the story, the same way an actor does on television. I have to do that same same sort of work in order to get in there and make it good. If you're just joining us, welcome. We're talking with award-winning author Sadiqa Johnson. If you want to ask Sadiqa questions, you can join in the conversation using the Q and A tab that's located in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to get to everyone's questions. So going back to your emotions, are you having mood swings as you like write novels? Not, not necessarily mood swings. I, you know, I do have to separate my writing from my regular life. So what I do to kind of, kind of support myself is that I write usually in the morning and then I'll do something very rigorous with my body to kind of get the story out. So I normally go for a hard run and listen to like really dirty hip hop music so that I'm like completely in another world. <laughs> so that when my kids come home from school, like I'm back, you know, I'm, I'm back. <laughs> I see, I see. Um, did you, I watched your promotional video on the Simon & Schuster website and I was surprised to hear people said it was a struggle like reading the book. I'm not sure what people prepared themselves for when they pick up a historical fiction novel like about 
slavery. Um, I imagine this one was harder to write though than your novels before. It was, I mean, there are a lot of really difficult scenes in the book, but, but what I kept telling myself was that these moments actually happen. I didn't make up those whipping scenes, those separation scenes, those family scenes, those hard to read scenes. I didn't make those up. I came across them in my research and I felt charged to tell the truth, you know, because our ancestors lived through those moments. And I kept telling myself, if our ancestors could, could live through those moments, mm -hmm the very least I could do was write about it, mm -hmm. right? That's the very least I could do. And, and, and the same for readers, the very least readers can do is read their experience because it happened. And we stand on their shoulders, you know? All of the things that we can do and, and, and move in this world now is because of their sacrifice. And so it is the very least I could do was to tell their story as honestly as possible. The decoy that's heavy, really heavy. Um, in keeping with the idea of ancestry and maintaining honor, uh, Sandy, Vicki Sandin says, where did you obtain the information for all of Phoebe's mother's healing herbs and potions? Mm. Ruth was one of my favorite characters. I will say that I think if I had been born at a different time in a different place, I could have been Ruth. I was so drawn to her strength, to her medicine, to her, her power to heal, um, to her knowledge of the herbs and, and the leaves and everything. I looked it up. I mean, I just, I looked it up. I, I found periodicals online that specifically spoke to slave medicine because they didn't trust um, Western medicine. They called it white people medicine. They didn't, they didn't trust it. Uh, so they really had their own way of life. And so I, I, I looked it up and I put it together until it made sense. It really resonated with me. Um, I didn't think about this until afterwards, but my mother's mother and my mom don't like to use a traditional medicine like if a doctor tells them like you should take this prescription then they typically reject it and they'll go in the kitchen and make their teas and i didn't even think about those things being passed down like as a modern african-american person is that part of your experience too was your mom in the kitchen like cooking up remedies i wish i wish <laughs> i can say that she was but i will say my mother-in-law actually is really good about certain remedies. And then I have friends who are from the Caribbean mm -hmm. uh, who hold on to those traditions and I'll be like, don't give her that. Just soak a lemon or put an onion and some lemon juice and have her drink that and then she'll feel better. So, so I kind of mix it all together for myself, you know, personally. Uh, Catherine Tate wants to know, my black great grandmother lived in rural Alabama with her white husband. Some of the family did pass into white, others did not, a concept of passing. I found this novel so true. Do you have plans for a second book covering the next generations? Hmm. <laughs> I get this question all the time. I wish I could say that I was writing a sequel. I'm, I'm sorry to say I am not currently writing a sequel. I am working on another novel that takes place in the 1940s and the 1950s that deal with some similar themes, but in a different way. I do want to know about some of the characters from Yellow Wife. I, I'm thinking about July, I'm thinking about Birdie, I'm thinking about the daughters, you know, as they have passed. And so I will never say never. I always leave strings open from each novel so that if I wanna go back and write a sequel, I have that opportunity. Tell me about any other challenges you faced in writing this story. The biggest challenge I think is wrapping my head around the fact that I was writing a story that took place in the 1850s. Um, the, the time, the difference, the, the way they spoke, the way they dressed. It, it, it really was something that I had to research to get it right. The other thing is I remember when I was maybe like on the second or third draft and I hit a roadblock in the writing mm -hmm. and I couldn't figure out what the problem was. And so I called one of my mentors and I was explaining it to her. And she said, 
Sadiqwa, the story that you're writing is not about slavery. Slavery is the backdrop. The story is about motherhood and sacrifice and love and family. And it was like, once I made that little tweak in my brain, it made it easier for me to move forward. When I dropped the time period as the backdrop and not feeling like I had to write a slave story. Mm -hmm. That was the difference for me. Tell me, when I read the story, it felt like there were moments where I had to stop and go, hmm, would I make that choice? Is that the effect that you were wanting people to come away from the book with? You know, that's a good question. I think I was really following the story that I heard in my head and, and there was a lot of different twists and turns. I will say that every time Phoebe started to get a little bit comfortable in her situation, it was very important for me to then go and pull the rug from underneath her feet because there's nothing comfortable about being an enslaved person mm -hmm. at any level. And even though she seemed to be a little bit more privileged than say those who worked in the field, I wanted to show that it's never a comfortable situation. And so that was intentional for me to just keep going in and pulling the rug from underneath her feet. I think one of my favorite instances of that is when one of the girls come in and she's preparing her to, you know, go do what she does. And um, she says that she's going to pray. So she takes the girl's hands and the girl says, yeah, we're going to pray. We're going to pray for you <laughs> and yeah. where your conscience went. I feel like that was a uniquely a uniquely black woman moment, right? Because I feel like sometimes there's only black women that could go like, okay, girl, like, hold on, you're, you're getting beside yourself. And this is one of the times where I felt like it brought up the idea of making choices, like evaluating choices to further your own bloodline, to take care of yourself, to make sure that your family is okay. And she does a lot of what she has to do um, did you have to pull any inspiration from any real life women that you know to think about what it takes for a woman to just do what she needs to survive? I mean, I live that every day, mm -hmm. right? Like as a mother, I have three children. I have a son. I have a 17 year old son who's driving, you know, and with everything that goes on in the world and the news, black men being shot down by police officers is something that I feel every single day. Mm -hmm. And so it was very easy for me in that respect to relate to Phoebe and her struggle with her own son, trying to keep him safe, you know, mm -hmm. trying to keep Monroe safe in the story. So it was something that I could feel in my heart. It's in my DNA, right? It's, it's something that we feel, we walk around, we carry it as a part of our story, as a part of our narrative. And so that never goes away for me. And it's very, uh, it's very easy for it to inform my writing. My writing is, is informed by my world, even when I'm writing historical fiction. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth Barron asks, was it common for slave owners to promise their offspring freedom in their adulthood? It was, it was. And I can say that I came across a lot of stories where that freedom, where that promise was fulfilled, but it was, and it was a way to keep the mother in line. And so for Master Jacob, it was a way for him to keep Ruth in line so that she would, you know, continue to be his woman and do what he needed her to do quietly without a fight, like keep Phoebe in line, you know? So it was, it was another way of exercising control by dangling the carrot of hope. Jacqueline Waite Johnson asks, Mary Lumpkin inherited her husband's land. Did a legal battle ensue because she was a woman and a colored woman given the time of history? I love this part of the story. <laughs> yes. So according to my research, and I always like to say according to my research, because they, there could be books that I did not read. Um, she was, she was awarded his land and his fortune. Karina Hinton, on the other hand, is one of the wives, one of the mulatto wives that come to the jail, who she's the dazzler, the, you know, the sparkly one. She actually 
had a very difficult time claiming what was left to her. So Silas Omohandro actually did the same thing. He left his fame, his fortune to Karina Hinton and their children, but because he had never formally freed her, nor did they legally get married, she got tied up in a lot of legal battles and lost a good portion of her fortune to the state of Virginia and to legal battles and things of that nature. Whereas for Mary Lumpkin, because she was freed and legally married, his will pretty much stood. The beautiful thing about Yellow Wife, and I think the thing that cinched me writing this story was that when I found out that Mary Lumpkin then leased the jail once she had it in her possession, she leased the jail to Nathaniel Culver who turned it into a school for free men to teach them how to read and to write. It went from the devil's half acre to God's half acre. And then years later, it becomes Virginia Union University, which is one of the first historical black colleges. And that just gave me goosebumps. And it made me really feel connected to the story. And, and I knew at that point that the story needed to be told. We're gonna pause here. Uh, it's time to take a break and hear from Sandy Chin about how you can continue to support GBH's efforts, not only beyond the page, but all the virtual events we continue to provide. Sandy, you wanna come and say hi? Hi, Soraya, thank you so much. And thank you to all of you at home for spending some time with us during today's Beyond the Page event. The discussion has been wonderful and it's always so good to see a community of people brought together by a story. And if you're enjoying today's Beyond the Page event, then please consider making a donation to GBH as a sustainer. Sustainers serve as a steady and reliable ongoing source of support for GBH, allowing us to keep the news and your favorite programs on air and online. You watch and listen to GBH programs all year long, so why not spread out your support throughout the year as well? Today, if you are able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustainer, you will receive an autographed copy of The Lost Apothecary in time for our next Beyond the Page event on Thursday, June 17th. Or if you'd like to read more from Sadiqa Johnson, we'd be happy to send you her book, And Then There Was Me, as our thank you gift to you. The choice is yours. Please give $5 a month as a GBH sustainer or $60 all at once, whatever works for you. And it's really easy. Just click on that link you see in our Zoom chat below or text GBH to 800 492-1111 and contribute what you can. All it takes is a few minutes of your time and a few dollars on your credit card each month. And as we approach the end of our fiscal year, your support today will help us reach our fundraising goals for the year. Please help us bring more stories to Beyond the Page events and to your home. And if you are already a GBH member, thank you so much for your support. We appreciate all that you do. And now back to Soraya with more of your questions. Thanks, Sandy. We're turning back to our discussion with Sadiqa Johnson. And remember to use the Q&A function. No need to wait. Jump right in and ask your questions. Sadiqa, do you know in real life what became of the descendants of Mary Lumpkin? Rebecca Gruber is asking. So in real life, I know that two of the daughters passed for white in Ipswich, Massachusetts. Um, they did go up to Massachusetts for school to go to school the way I've described it in the story. And then they passed for white. And so they sort of disappear from history. The daughter that actually stays with Phoebe is very true. Um, for Mary Lumpkin, one child does stay behind with her. And they end up going down to New Orleans for a spell. And Mary Lumpkin ends up in, I think, New Philadelphia, Ohio and they start a restaurant, she and this one child, the one who I call Birdie. So that's, that's all I know about her children because once they pass, they, they disappear from, from history. Mm. And Monroe was not actually one of Mary Lumpkin's children, as far as I know. He was just part of the glue that I needed to make the story fictional. Mm -hmm. um, Kate asks, how did you settle on character names? Great question, Kate. So Phoebe, she was kind of difficult for me to come up with her name. And as a writer, you know 
when that is not the character's name. They will let you know, that's not my name. So Phoebe had about three names prior to me settling on Phoebe. And I was visiting a plantation in Charles City, Virginia, and I went into the kitchen house and they had a ledger on the wall with all of, well, probably not all of them, but a good deal of the enslaved people who worked there, who, um, who lived on the plantation with their names, sometimes their age, sometimes their price, sometimes, you know, different things about them. And I came across the name Phoebe spelled with a Y. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's her name. Essex Henry's name actually came off of my family tree. My cousin had done my mother's side of our family tree. And so there was an Essex and there was a Henry and I put them together. Other names like July and um, some of the girls who come through the jail, I just Googled slave ledgers and I was able to find pages and pages of different slave ledgers. And that was also another way of me honoring our ancestors and really giving a voice to those who did not have a voice by using their actual names and kind of creating a story for them. Can we go back to the idea of you having Essex Henry as a, a piece of glue that you need to tell the story? Can you talk more about that? Yeah, so Essex Henry, well, not Essex Henry, the glue was more so Monroe. So I needed Monroe to glue Phoebe's past to her present. Um, so when she got pregnant by Essex and then she carries this baby onto the jail, you know, I knew it was going to be something that was going to create a lot of plot points, a lot of hurt, a lot of a lot of a, a lot of feelings for her. And right away, when the baby popped into the story, I knew the jailer was never going to accept him. Mm -hmm. So I knew it was always going to be this tug of war between Phoebe and him. And then when they started to have children together, I knew it was going to be that that extra thing that was going to give the story a little bit more momentum and depth. Uh, Marge W. Stark asks, I just went to a talk in Ipswich, Massachusetts about the Ipswich Female Seminary. Was this the finishing school that the girls attended? I'm not sure, to be honest. I know I have the school written down. So first of all, let me just tell you about my, my notes. My, I am, I'm, I'm like the messy professor <laughs> with my notes. I, I write everything in my journal. So then when it's time for me to find stuff, I literally have to flip back and find, remember what date I wrote it in. So all of that to say, this was three years of my life. And I started, I wrote the book between 2016 and 2019. Mm. So I'm not exactly sure of the name of the school just off the top of my head, but it was in Ipswich, Massachusetts. Was the news cycle playing into your writing at all? The news is always just kind of in the back of my head. I wouldn't say that I consciously use the news, but if something, you know, everything could pop up in the story. Mm -hmm. If there's something that sparks a thought in me, you know, even just in conversation, my friends know to be careful what they say around me <laughs> because anything could, could end up in my story, historical fiction, contemporary fiction. There's a way to weave almost anything in. Mm -hmm. So if something pops up and it informs or fixes a problem I'm having, it's very likely that it could end up in my story. My, my mind is always open listening. Um, Catherine Koaloff asks, where did you get the images for the end papers in the book? Are they actually from slave jails? Yes, absolutely. So for those who don't have a copy of the book, um, I'll try and show you the end papers. Um, so these end papers are actually a picture of what the Lumpkins Jail looked like. So it, it is, it's, it's kind of a blurred picture, but it's, it's the best picture that we can find to give you an account. Got it. I have a question. This is an interesting one from an anonymous attendee. I see that Lisa Wingate has a quote on the front cover of your book. I believe she identifies as white. And her most recent novel, Book of Lost Friends, is very much about the race, about race in the post-Civil War South, as well as today. Do you think people of any racial identity can write well about people of other racial identities? And should they? Hmm. Wow. That's a heavy question. Very heavy. Very heavy. Very heavy. I will say this. I could only speak for myself in, in this case. 
Uh, for me, as I mentioned earlier, connecting with the story of Mary Lumpkins and interpreting it into my fiction for Phoebe was not difficult because I feel like their story is in my DNA, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm very, um, I'm very, I, when I hear the stories of the migrant children who are left at the border, um, coming from Honduras and Mexico and countries like that, I'm very interested in like where that storyline goes, mm -hmm. what happens to those children, what happens to those families. But I don't feel a calling to write that story because I don't have that story in my DNA, in my makeup. I don't feel that relation to it in a way that I know I need to, to make the story come alive. Mm -hmm. Other writers may not feel like that, but I know for me, I have to write about something that I could feel um, that I, if, if I hadn't experienced someone I know who I'm close to has, and that's really what for me makes my story heartfelt and jumps off the page. And so I don't feel like I would be qualified to do a story about, you know, children at the border justice as someone who may have experienced that or know someone or that's in their DNA could write that story. So I think artists have to do what they're called to do. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's really what I try and do with my stories. Tony Walker asks, has Phoebe's book with the names of the women she dressed been preserved anywhere? In my imagination. <laughs> <laughs> I totally made all of that up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, this is an odd one. Um, it's another anonymous attendee. After Essex and their son escaped, how do you imagine how Phoebe was punished? Mm, I don't. I don't imagine it. To be 100% frank with you all, I felt like once Phoebe was able to get them to the ship, that was as far as I could go. I had nothing left to give. I couldn't imagine it. I didn't want to feel it. I didn't want to experience the fallout with Phoebe. And, and so I just let the story go at mm -hmm. that point. Mm -hmm. Arlene asks, were all of the beating scenes recorded somewhere, specifically the beating of pregnant women? Yes, all of the whipping scenes were true. All of them I read. Um, the one with the pregnant woman, I can't recall which book I read it in off the top of my head, but I read that one. And the scene where Essex comes back to the jail and he, or comes to the jail and he's punished with the red pepper bath, that particular scene happened in 50 Years a Slave uh, by Charles Ball. And that was one of the slave narrative books that I had read. And I was able to take that scene and put it into the story. But this, the scene with the pregnant woman was true. I don't know if she was whooped because she was teaching other people to read. I just know that she was whooped until she miscarried. Mm. Jerry asks, to what extent do you feel constrained by the historical facts in crafting your story? Or do you feel constrained at all? Yeah, I didn't feel constrained because I, I'm a fiction writer. So my goal was to be as truthful as I can, but also to weave a beautiful piece of fiction. Mm -hmm. I write primarily for myself first. I am a very difficult audience. When I read a book, it has to do a few things. It has to teach me about craft. Mm -hmm. It has to be a page turner. It has to be something that I am constantly walking around thinking about, or it's not, it's not gonna work for me. And so mm -hmm. that is always my goal as I'm writing a novel. Mm -hmm. Do you have any interesting quirks that you tried to keep out of this piece of work? Hmm. I don't have any interesting like quirks that would go into the story, but just like in general for my writing, I normally write in the same place all the time for a very long time. So for instance, for the last, I don't even know how many months I've been writing on a desktop. So it's very hard for me then to pick up my laptop and start writing. So, mm -hmm. so little things like that. If I pick a space, if I write at the kitchen table, I, I have to write at the kitchen table for weeks or until I move sections or something like that. Like there has to be some sort of continuity in it. 
because I feel like that's my muse is going to come because I'm doing the same thing all the time. Okay. So kind of bound by place each time. Is it the same place for every novel? Um, it's the same few places. Uh, so it's the same few places. So it's either my office, it's my kitchen. Every now and again, I'll reward myself with like a trip to like Starbucks or Panera. <laughs> But that's only once I'm in the like editing phase where maybe I just want to read through it and see like what I need to change or something like that. But particularly when I'm like writing the beginning stories, I have to be in the same place. I know the book was turned into an audio book that Robin Miles narrated. Were you involved in that process? And what was that like? So yes, they did ask my opinion, thank goodness. I, <laughs> I have a really great partnership with Simon and Schuster. They asked my opinion on the cover we went back and forth on it until we found one that we thought was, you know, wonderful for the story. So I really love, mm -hmm. love this cover, all the detail in the skirt with the city of Richmond behind it and the sewing machine was all just kind of things that we worked out together. They did send me a list of narrators for uh, Yellow Wife. Robin Miles also narrated my second novel, Second House from the Corner, and I knew she had done an amazing job with it. And so she was an easy choice for Yellow Wife. Cindy Sharfstein asks, do you see this as a potential movie? And if you do, is there an actor you can envision being the jailer? His character was such a contradiction. You were able to effectively portray a human side to a person that mostly seemed filled with evil and malice. Mm, thank you. That was what I was trying to accomplish. I'm glad I did that. <laughs> I, I would let, you know, all, I, all writers want their books made into movies, I, I think at least. I know that every <laughs> single book I've written, I'm like, okay, so when this becomes a movie. So yes, I would absolutely love to see Yellow Wife as a movie or as a series on Hulu. So if you know someone, please call them, tell them that I'm interested, send them my way. Um, and, and as far as characters, I, I should know his name. There's a movie called Judah and the Black Messiah that came out in February about Fred Hampton and the Black Panther Party. The gentleman who played the FBI agent in that movie, I thought as I was watching it, I kept thinking, oh my gosh, he would be a great jailer. So I'm sorry, I don't know his name. <laughs> it's okay, our audience will get on it. <laughs> probably <laughs> before, before the end of our discussion, probably. Um, some of these are a little bit repetitive. You discussed that you took a couple of years to write Yellow Wife, right? Yeah, it took about three years. I started the research in 2016 and I researched probably exclusively from about April to September mm -hmm. because when September comes, I always feel like it's a new year for me. When the kids go back to school, I need to be writing. Um, there was a lot of stop and go in there, but we actually sold the book to Simon and Schuster in October of 2019. I had never heard, Debbie B asks, I had never heard the term yellow wife before I read your book. Is this a term that was used commonly for women like Phoebe? When I read it in his will was why I used it. I know that Anthony Burns, who's the real life inspiration for Essex Henry's character, he referred to Mary Lumpkin as the yellow woman. Uh, so in his book, he refers to her as the yellow woman. And so between the two, that's where I got the, got the title. Mm -hmm. And people will sometimes use the word in present day. An anonymous attendee asks, we have heard of Master Jacob taking advantage of his black slaves. Was it indeed not unusual for Mrs. Delphinia taking similar advantage of Essex? Were the children born of these dalliances accepted as blood relatives on the male side only or also accepted on the female side? Um, that's a great question. So on the female side, so my inspiration for Mrs. Delphina forcing Essex Henry um, into relations with her was because I felt like it was an unexplored portion of slavery. We always hear about the latter, that the master you know, lusted after the women in the fields or master went after the women to help them procreate so that he could have more, you know, more children, which was more wealth and all of that. But I felt like that was a little unknown story that in fact, I 
I found little whispers of it in my research. Again, another thing that I think was completely from history. I found the whisper of white women who um, exploited their black slaves and you know made them sleep with them. And then when the children were born, oftentimes if the child came out and the child was brown, the woman would cry rape and the man would be hung, even, even though it was her idea. Or they would take the baby and pass the baby down into the field and have someone raise the baby as their own. Or as Mrs. Delfina did, they would get rid of the child. So there was a lot of different ways that it would happen. But if it came out that this slave was with the woman, normally he was the one who was going to be punished, even if it was her, her idea. You have a lot of interest in turning this into a movie. Ooh. Sandra Dean says, you know, this has to be one. So who would you imagine playing Phoebe? So for Phoebe, you know, someone yesterday, I was on with a book club yesterday and they mentioned Zendaya, which I had not thought of Zendaya. Mm -hmm. um, she's been in a lot of movies. I think most recently was Malcolm and Marie, mm -hmm. which her <laughs> most recent movie. So someone mentioned Zendaya yesterday. I always think of Journey Smollett mm -hmm. from Lovecraft Country. Mm -hmm. I think that she is fabulous and talented. Um, I also was thinking of, um, oh, someone else mentioned the girl who played in uh, A Wrinkle in Time. I can't remember her name with the curly hair, but the main character, I think she may be a little young. Maybe by the time we get to that point, she'll have a glow up. <laughs> um, as my, my daughter says that glow up instead of grow up. So, you know, maybe she'll, she'll, she'll be there. And then there was a girl named Alexandria Ship who was in Shaft, the one with Samuel L. Jackson. Mm -hmm. And she played the girlfriend of his son. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, she would be interesting as, as Phoebe. So a few people. I would love, though, for Alicia Keys to do all of the music. <laughs> let her play put all there, of Put it out yes, there. Put Alicia out there. Keys, if you're listening. Yes, let her play all of the piano. And she could even play Karina Henson. <laughs> uh, was there anything surprising to you as you were writing this piece? There were a lot of surprises. I think the books that I grew up, and I've always been drawn to books about slavery. I think I've always wanted to know and understand, like, how did this happen? Mm. So I was reading books by, you know, Margaret Walker. I read Jubilee when I was a teenager and uh, Family by J. California Cooper. But those books always dealt with slavery on a plantation setting. Mm -hmm. So this was the first experience that I had with slavery in a city like Richmond. So the fact that enslaved people were sent downtown with a note from their master and being able to hire themselves out, something I had not thought of. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that that level of trust existed. You know, there were no phone phones. It's not like they could call ahead and say, hey, you know, Caroline's there. You can borrow her for two weeks. Like, I, I'm not sure how that all worked out, but I didn't know that that was something that they did until I, until I was researching Yellow Wife. And then just the whole you know, jailers being the pariahs of society and then marrying the mulatto women, that was new for me. The whole issue of fancy girls, you know, the fact that Phoebe had to dress these mulatto women so that they could be sold into, you know, for men who were going to basically put them in a brothel, you know, and, and sell them for sex or, you know, they were worth as much as a male field hand. And I didn't know that until I started to get into the nitty gritty of researching Richmond slavery. So mm -hmm. that was all different and new for me. Lynn Levy asks, do you believe that this history recorded at the museum was accurate or sugarcoated about Mr. Lumpkin? Hmm. I, I got a lot of different books and I feel like when I streamed everything together, it felt pretty comprehensive. Like I could see the story come together from various outlets. So I would say pretty accurate. Mary Batucci asks, given the current social climate in our country right now, the story is particularly and unfortunately so relevant and necessary. I'm sure some people wanna pretend slavery didn't happen or wasn't that bad. 
Have you received any pushback from readers who were upset by this story? And if so, how have you handled it? Hmm. I'm so fortunate that I have not received any pushbacks. Everything has been so glowing and I am so appreciative that people are ready to have this conversation. I tell my children all the time that everything that we are experiencing in this country goes back to slavery. In order for us to know where we're going, we need to know where we came from. I was in conversation with Robert Jones Jr. He's the author of The Prophets, which is another story that's amazing. It was a New York Times bestseller about slavery. And he said to me, he said, Sadiqwa, do you realize that the jail in your story is very much in alignment with mass incarceration of black and brown people in this mm -hmm. country today. And I thought that was not anything I intended, but history constantly repeats itself. Lachelle Brown asks, what prompted you to use Oliver Twist as the book Phoebe reads when the jailer discovers she knows how to read? So I, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, it's not a great story. I literally just put in the year and whatever books came up, I chose from that. So I Googled at whatever year, maybe it was 1855 when she did that. And I thought, well, the book couldn't have just come out. So let me see books that came out in like 1848 or something like that. <laughs> and whatever books came up, I would just choose from them. Makes sense. Teresa asks, what types of historical resources would you recommend to writers interested in writing historical fiction? I would say you have to read books that are like the book you want to read. You know, for me, when I was researching Yellow Wife, I spent almost three years of my life reading books by enslaved people or reading textbooks that detail the lives of enslaved people or reading fiction about enslaved people. And all of that informed my writing. So if you are interested in writing World War II books, then I would say, I mean, there is no shortage of World War II fiction novels at the bookstore. But I would say just surround yourself um, with those type of stories and that would help you to get to the story you're trying to tell. We're almost out of time, but I do wanna ask, what are you into right now? What are you reading? Ooh, so I am about to start The Prophets that I mentioned earlier by Robert Jones Jr. I just finished Outlaw by Anna North. Um, I also finished Infinite Country by Patricia Engel. And also, oh, oh my gosh, I listened to How the One-Armed Girl Swept Her House. And that was so amazing. The author's name was Sherry Jones for that book. So I'm constantly reading. I just discovered audiobooks this year. I know I'm such a late bloomer. <laughs> I know, I know. But it has been just wonderful. I just pop them in my ear. I cook dinner. I go for a run. And then I'm reading something else at night. And so I'm constantly surrounding myself with stories. It's been great. And I saw one other interesting question, but I do not see a name for the person. The best piece of writing advice that you've received. The best piece of writing advice, uh, the best piece of writing advice I have received is keep your butt in the chair. <laughs> keep your butt in the chair and write, write. To be a writer, you actually have to write. You can start with 10 minutes before bed, be consistent. 10 minutes in a week or two will turn into 20 minutes before you know you're writing 30 minutes. And then you look down and you have 50 pages in front of you. And so just keep your butt in the chair and, and write. I'm so glad that you did, Sadiqa Johnson. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, and to all of you out there watching, thank you so much for tuning in to this month's Beyond the Page Book Club. And again, a special thank you to Sadiqa Johnson for joining us today. Thank you. It's been an honor and a privilege. Thank you for having me. Join us over the coming weeks as we take a dive into our June selection. We'll be reading The Lost Apothecary by Sarah Penner. The virtual conversation will take place on Thursday, June 17th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Don't forget to also join our Beyond the Page Facebook group for even more discussion topics as you read the novel. We look forward to connecting with you again, and we hope that you and your family are staying healthy, both physically and emotionally, during this time. Good night.